A very good afternoon and welcome to your authoritative business program. This is K10 Business Today. On the show today, we shall be hosting Ken Gishinga, even as we take stock of some of the key developments in this week in the world of business. From President Uhuru Kenyatta's upcoming trip to China and the United States, and of course, the visit by UK Prime Minister Theresa May. We'll be having that analysis here in a short while as we take stock of some of the big stories in business. Over and above that, we'll be giving you some more updates on some of the results from different companies from the Nairobi Securities Exchange. Britam has also released its results, as well as Kenya Reinsurance. And of course, what does this mean for shareholders at the end of the day? Let's keep engaging on social media. You can tweet us at KT News. You can tweet me at Agina Abi as we continue to give you the latest in business. Well, uh, like I mentioned, Ken Gishinga is already with us here in the studio. And uh, Ken, always a pleasure having you on board. Thanks for having me. And uh, of course, uh, some interesting analysis coming up here on the program, just to pick his mind on all this very much important subject. For now, let's take you to some of our top stories as of this hour. And in the fight against illicit trade, the Kenya Revenue Authority has blocked drug tycoons from smuggling heroin from Uganda into the country valued at about 2.9 million shillings. While the drugs were discovered after the officers became suspicious of a package by the K-9 unit at DHL Yard, Kerry's dedication in curbing illicit trade was further heightened by an additional manpower of K-9 handlers and equipment at the many ports of entry. We'll be having that story in our subsequent bulletins. But let's move on to other stories and mission essential drugs and supplies have undergone a loss of 114 million shillings due to slow clearance of cargo at the Nairobi Inland Container Depot and delayed payments by health facilities under the National Hospital Insurance Fund. The organization has not been able to replenish stocks and the demand for drugs and medical supplies continues to grow steadily. While well, the government was expected to inject 60 billion shillings into the health sector in the next five years to strengthen hiring of human resource as well as plug in gaps of commodities available in the market. Universal health coverage, as you know, is now the talk of town. And the way it's having impact is that uh, even in the faith-based facilities, which may have had low patient numbers, the numbers have greatly gone up because of NHIF cover. Because patients are coming out more because of the free health cover which they are having. What it means is that when, uh, NHIF now is becoming a major financer for the health facilities. In fact, as we are going around, we discovered that some of the facilities are saying 90% of their uh, funding is coming from NHIF. So NHIF is going to be very important in the universal health coverage, and the facilities are more getting more and more dependent on NHIF to fund their health care, including the patients. Well, the Kenya Reinsurance Corporation has announced a 6% drop in its net incomes in the just released 2018 first half year result. Well, the insurer also saw a fall in its profits from 2.2 billion shillings the same last time last year to 1.7 billion shillings this year. Well, the drop is attributed to stiff competition and the setting up of domestic reinsurance in the country. It operates in North Africa, Asia and Middle East. Kenya Re has been experiencing leadership wrangles. Well, the Employment and Labor Relations Court reinstated the ousted managing director, Jadia Moarania, a decision Kenya Re board said it will appeal. Profit achieved was 1.7 billion in 2018, which compare, which is lower than the half year June last year of 2.2, actually 23 percent lower. The profit after tax of 1.2 billion also compared uh, lower at than 1.6 similar period the previous year. The net earned premium stood at. 6.3 billion as of June 2018. Investment income, however, grew by 14% to start at 1.6 billion uh, 
to start at 1.9 billion, uh, sorry, half from 1.6 the previous year, which is a, 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 a growth. National insurance companies, all of them had compulsory sessions, which of course reduces the available premiums to reinsurers who are not domestic to those markets. The effect of domestication is the same because again, local capacities in those countries have to be satisfied before premiums are externalized. Well, still staying with results, the Nairobi Securities Exchange net earnings for the half year ending 30th June 2018 are up by 72% recorded in the same period last year. Well, the firm's profit stands at uh, 133.9 million shillings compared to 77.8 million. Well, total income rose by 24% to hit 283 million shillings from 351. The group's balance sheet also recorded a 14% growth from 2.02 billion to 2.3 billion shillings. Well, Britain Holdings PLC has announced that it will allow for early redemption of the 6 billion shilling corporate bond issued in 2014, giving investors an early opportunity to redeem their investments. Well, the five-year tenure note was pegged on a 13% fixed interest rate payable semi-annually with investors required to have a minimum of 100,000 shillings to participate in the offer. Well, the firm reported a pre-tax profit of 1.4 billion shillings in the first half of 2018, a 7% growth from 1.3 billion in June 2017. Yes, we have just announced that uh, the board has given approval for the early redemption of the 6 billion medium-term note that uh, uh, we issued in June 2014. Uh, the board was due for full repayment on uh, around the same date, June 2019, but the board saw it fit to redeem that bond early. Why this? Because uh, we have a very strong balance sheet. We have largely accomplished the investments uh, that uh, we wanted to use the money for and we are generating the necessary returns from that investment. We have a very strong balance sheet and we didn't see any need to wait for 30th of June or whatever date next year in order to repay the bond. So that's the reason uh, that uh, the board saw it uh, necessary to uh, redeem this bond. When will it uh, be paid? As I have announced, uh, after the board approval, we need to call all the note holders who gave us the six billion to approve the fact that we should pay off this bond. That meeting will be announced in the newspapers and as soon as we get the approval, we will then just pay it off. Well, away from the results now, let's take it to China, where stakeholders are preparing for the 2018 China-Africa Summit, commonly known as FOCAC, which is set to be held in Beijing. Well, the mega summit to be will actually kick off from the 3rd and 4th of September is the 7th of its kind and will be co-chaired by President Cyril Ramaphosa of South Africa and Xi Jinping of China. State leaders from the continent are expected to deliberate on China-Africa relations. Our reporter Trix Ngado is in China and now brings us the latest. The Forum for China-Africa Cooperation, or FOCAC Summit, as it has come to be known, is arguably this year's biggest diplomatic event in China, bringing together heads of state from the African continent and dignitaries from China and around the world. So naturally, officials are laying the groundwork for the September event. <laughs> The event's official website is part of that infrastructure containing information on the summit and events surrounding it. The last summit held in Johannesburg was co-chaired by President Xi Jinping and then South African President Jacob Zuma. Coming hot on the heels of the BRICS summit, this year's mega-conference will be held in Beijing. Top on the agenda list would be strengthening friendship with the 53 member states, injecting energy into the development of bilateral ties and 
consolidating the political foundation for cooperation between parties. During FOCAC 2015, China pledged a generous helping of $60 billion in investment funds. While China's generosity has inspired warnings of caution from various quarters, the African diplomatic community here in Beijing is beaming with optimism. Zambia, like other fellow African countries here, cherishes the excellent and long-standing relations with the People's Republic of China. Connect Africa to China and to the world to look into the issue of a shared future where all the countries, including Namibia, are looking what is there for them. Not only Namibians, but it's Africans. According to Ugandan ambassador to China, Crispus Kinyonga, more and more Chinese investors are choosing to partner with locals and set up shop on the continent using locally available raw materials and employing locals. But China, the investor of China, founded the materials in Uganda. Now he's producing the tires in Uganda. Now these industrial parks are going to move like fire. For the FOCAC summit just around the corner, it is expected that both sides, China and Africa, are going to explore more ways of working together towards attaining what is now being called a win-win cooperation. Time will only tell what will be accomplished in this summit. Trix Ingado for KTN News, Beijing, China. Well, thanks, Trix, for that update. Of course, we'll be giving you a wall-to-wall -wall coverage of the FOCAC summit here on KTN News. Moving on, in a bid to grow the manufacturing sector to 15%, private sector stakeholders are now joining hands with the government to invest more in value addition. KTN's Julia Wino has that story. Manufacturing is one of the government's big four priority projects. Although the manufacturing sector employs a sizable chunk of the workforce, the industry's contribution to the country's GDP is still too low, standing at 12%. The government is now calling on the private sector to seize the opportunities around special economic zones, as well as the government should create a housing plan to build a million houses by goods to ensure that whatever is produced within the country does not compete unfairly with uh, illicit products. According to Kiprona Kiptoni, one of the initiatives taken is drafting a handbook for local investors to come in handy for them in identifying gaps to plug in. We would like to actually be able to put in a condense as much information in a useful, in a palatable way that can be shared with our stakeholders across the country. Julio Wino, KTN News. Well, to matters banking now, the Cooperative Bank of Kenya has launched a robust strategy to tap into micro, small and medium-sized enterprises, even as the bank tries to diversify its revenues. Well, will this be the magic bullet to unlock the huge potential in the SME sector for the bank? Tandiwe Over 90% of Kenya's private small businesses with over 15 million Kenyans employed in registered businesses. Arthur Mushangi, the Director of Retail and Business Banking at Cooperative Bank, notes this market is highly underserved. We believe that with the right support from various industry stakeholders, uh, industry players, and especially the banking sector, this is a sector which is capable of driving and turning around the economy of this country. With small businesses fast expanding, the demand for affordable credit has also been growing. Moses Gitau, head of business banking, says banks must change tact and tap SMEs despite them having unbankable tag. One of the things that, uh, that, that MSMEs have been experiencing, and we must credit the government for the effort that they have put there, is to say that registration processes have been a bit tedious. The government has put out of effort in terms of now enabling and we have seen these numbers grow. I, I think back in, in around 2016, we had less than, less than, less than 900,000 registered. 
Cooperative Bank has committed to align itself to the government's requirement of ensuring that a minimum of 20% of its lending goes to the MSME sector. Tendiwe Yego, reporting for KTN News. Well, Equity Group subsidiary FinSouth Africa is angling to lure top banks to tap into into its products as the company expands its revenue streams. FinServe's managing director Jack Ngari says that uh, the firm has already enlisted three local banks including CDN, KCB and cooperative banks as it seeks to show its independence to the market. Earlier this week the company asserted its independence by unveiling a separate management board and is now pushing to broaden its product and service spectrum. And Since then we've started the journey of um, you know saying that look we have done such a great job for for equity group you know digitizing all six countries uh, across the region rolling out easy pay um, rolling out easy app um, implementing equitel for for kenya um, and now we are actually providing some of our payment services even further than kenya or east africa we are now providing some of our payment services in ethiopia for example so so we, we, we said, look, I think there's a bigger benefit here um, other than just providing the services for the bank. We wanted to open it up for more people, um, more banks, more circles, MFIs, cooperatives, uh, developers who want to innovate but just don't have the capability or, or the technologies available to them to build sound financial systems. So that is now what we launched, um, I think, the day before yesterday. Um, so to, we can empower this group of this community to be able to offer more financial services. Quite a busy week for banks as they worked day and night to report.